安尼，咱做欢喜吼，会当访问到即个伫 U C L A 咧做心理医生的迄个 Water Down 吼，陈先生。Sure, sure, absolutely. Ha happy to talk about that. So that's actually um, uh, something that I, I started even during my my residency. So the so um, as a as a dis not a disclaimer, but just to can provide you some background. So I, I was um, I served in the United States Marines uh, from 1996 to 2002 um, as a reservist. And so I have an intimate understanding of what, what military culture uh, entails or involves. So the, the reason it kind of appeared on my radar was that I remember very distinctly a patient, uh, this is during my second year of residency, and we were interviewing them at, at the VA. And um, this patient was quite angry at, at being there, didn't want to be there. He was actually being hospitalized involuntarily. And he was complaining about the care that he had received at the VA about how all the people that he had met uh, did not understand or what it was like to be a veteran. How can you guys treat me if you don't understand my experience? And he, s and he said specifically, you know, I asked my therapist, um, do you even know what OEF, OIF means? Right? And the therapist did not know. So OEF, OIF uh, stands for Operation Iraqi Freedom, OIF, and Operation Enduring Freedom, uh, OEF, which referred to the operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. So most, of, a lot of vets coming through the VA at that time, or even now, in their, in their notes will say, this is a 38-year-old OEF, OIF veteran coming in for care for PTSD. And at that time, when I heard that, I thought, oh, this is, this is ridiculous. This is, that acronym is used over and over and over again in these notes. How can your th therapist or your provider not know what that means? So then I, 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 I uh, approached some of my classmates and I said, and I recounted this experience with, this, um, with the veteran. I said, oh yeah, he thought we didn't know what OEF, OEF meant. And I would say 75% of my fellow residents and colleagues who were working at the VA at the time actually said, yeah, I actually don't know what that means. Which was a little bit shocking because again, they had been working at the VA for at least the you know, first two years and it had never occurred to you to look up or even ask what this acronym stood for. You were reading it every single day, no doubt. You were coming across it multiple times a day. So that's when I um, started, the, uh, started creating a lecture series to help educate fellow mental health providers or anybody in medicine about military culture, drawing upon my own experience serving in the Marines. And from the, the beginning, it's really about the basics. What does the what is the military what's what is the military? Um, in the United States, there's probably I think it's one to two percent of our population has served in the military. So, and at any time in our history, this is like the lowest percentage. Even though we even though the wars have been at the forefront of our minds for the last twenty years, it's only been a very small percentage of the population that's actually served in those conflicts. And so on any given day, if you come across anybody in the street and you ask them about their understanding of the military, they probably will not be able to tell you much. They may be able to say, may be able to say oh, yeah, I had an uncle in Vietnam, right? or my grandfather served in World War II, but I myself have no idea of what serving in the, in the military entails. So that, just from the very basics, educating my fellow colleagues about this is what you know, the military is in the United States. These are our different branches. This is the rank structure. Because when we're talking to our veterans, they're often referring to experiences they had while they served. And they're using a lot of nomenclature and terms and acronyms that are, are related to their, their military service. And I would say that most of my colleagues never kind of asked to clarify, oh, what do you mean by that? Or what does that mean? So really, it was about, number one, giving a, a basic understanding of kind of what are our patients talking about? Because at the end of the day, 
the better we understand our patients and their experience, the better we can provide care for them. But right. What's so special about a military culture yeah. besides the acronym you were just talking about? Yeah. So besides that, so it's understanding um, how mental health is viewed in the military. And that's evolved over time. And so if when you ask veterans who uh, you know, served in like 2004 to 2010, 2012, they will talk about how I was clearly symptomatic with PTSD while I was in, but I, I could not talk about it. I could not say I need help. Because I saw my fellow soldiers or Marines who did say they had uh, PTSD, and they were looked down upon or shamed by their, their fellow colleagues, and they did not receive the support that they needed. Now, as, um, as mental health issues became kind of more prominent, uh, awareness increased, and there was more talk about it from, from the top down. We're talking, you know, the president, the generals, right? You know, you talk to, to veterans who were uh, leaving the military around 2018, 2020, they're, they're able to tell you, yes, yeah, I'm able to talk about, uh, I was able to talk about that I had PTSD and I got, I got the care that I needed, yeah. right? Um, but also to understand that depending on different branches of the military and also depending on what you do for the military, there's subcultures, right? It's not just a military culture. There's a culture of the Marines. There's a culture of the Air Force. There's a culture of the Navy. And even within the different branches, there's a culture of the infantry, which is very different than someone who has served, let's say, in an administrative role, maybe someone who served in the intelligence or logistic role, right? Um, so appreciating that. Um, because I think, you know, when we, a lot of my colleagues, when they were talking to, to patients, asking about kind of what happened to you, and, and um, you know, some patients would be like, oh, I could not talk about my, my PTSD at all. And others would be like, yeah, I could talk freely about it. And there was a, a disconnect as far as why is there so much difference, right? These people served maybe around the same time. They were in different branches. Is one person lying, right? Uh, are they not telling me the whole truth, right? Um, so again, educating them about how it's, it's, a, it's a complex system um, that certainly erred toward the side of, of not talking about mental health. Right? And, and even now, I think, uh, even though it's much better than it used to be, let's say, five or ten years ago, I would not be surprised if someone you know, came out of the Marines or the Army um, last week and said, yeah, I had a lot of symptoms. I couldn't talk about it because I still saw people being shamed around me. You know, there were... Um, examples of there's so, so some, the, the military created something called the wounded warrior battalions mm -hmm. so these are essentially folks who were injured during combat that uh, could no longer carry out their duties uh, and then perhaps were in the process of being treated or being discharged right but they couldn't just like you know they weren't just like kicking them out they were, they were, they were trying to get them better first before they discharged them there were nurses in these wounded warrior battalions taking care of these injured soldiers marines airmen sailors who would tell them to their face I don't believe in PTSD this is not a real illness right these are these are healthcare professionals telling these service members that this is a fake illness or fake disease it's like the AIDS pandemic when the nurse is saying it's God's punishment <laughs> right yeah this is this is right this is not real I don't I don't believe that you have it right so you can imagine if they were hearing that from their medical providers, what were they hearing from you know, people in their unit, right? And so I, I think um, to understand where they're coming from, why they're so, perhaps you know, they're engaging with you, they're sitting across from you, but why are they so reluctant to talk about it? Because there's still a lot of shame and guilt associated with um, you know, saying that you, you have symptoms, that you were, you were debilitated by them, right? So again, that uh, it was really in service of educating my my peers, my colleagues, um, about what our service members went through, so that we can better understand how they're presenting today and how we can best help them. From your experience, is that a resentment between the, the veterans and the civilians? Hmm. Like the veteran, well, I mean, the the veteran when they look at the civilian, they hmm. feel like. What do you guys do? <laughs> is that a resentment there that's also part of the cost or part, part of the, I won't say culture or not? Yeah, that's an that's a, that's a, that's a interesting question. Um, is it, I'm not sure if you observed that because I... I 
I so, got the impression. I don't know where I got it. Yeah. But I feel that's what so one, one of my, uh, a patient, um, uh, so this is two, two examples. I remember one patient saying, once you go military, you never go back. And there was actually an article from uh, JAMA, like internal medicine. It's like a JAMA article, I think back probably maybe 20 or 30 years ago, uh, from a internal medicine f a physician who was actually drafted uh, to serve in Vietnam. And he talked about how after he came back from Vietnam, he felt like an army doctor dressed in civilian clothes, being a civilian. So it's this idea that once you undergo that transformation, it's, it's kind of hard to kind of like switch your mentality back. And I can, I can certainly see that, right? I, I mean, I went through the process. The military spends a lot of time and money um, indoctrinating you into their mindset, right? There's very little time or money spent de-indoctrinating you <laughs> to go back to the civilian world. You just kind of expected that, oh yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll adapt to it, right? Um, you know, the military, you know, this is all volunteer force, right? No one, no one drafted us, no one, no one forced us to sign up, sign up, right? We serve, uh, you know, our chief and commander is a civilian, the president of the United States. That's, right? We serve the civilian population, right? Um, I, I think everyone's perspective is a little bit different. I think, you know, veterans who, I have certainly seen veterans who, again, um, have come back from, uh, war and conflicts and have had a very difficult time integrating back into civilian society um, in, no large, in no small part due to PTSD symptoms, right? Um, I think they've, they found it much more difficult to integrate than they thought it would be. Now, if you have to remember, you know, when most people join the military, they're like 18, 19 years old, right? Their brains are still developing. And in the very many, f in the, the, the most formative years of their life, they were in a very structured setting that is unlike w w how we operate in, in the civilian world. And to go from that after serving four, maybe even like 10 years, to, to adapt to that, it can be very challenging, right? And again, it, this is, doesn't happen to everybody, but you can imagine why they have difficulty but, doing but that. But that's a part of the issue you need to mention how the veterans different from the other patients in a way. Yeah, I mean, the, the veterans, again, yes, um, you know, they, they, we've asked them to do things that no civilian has ever done. They've seen things that no civilian or most civilians don't do. Um, and um, yeah, they, they quote unquote grew up, you know, in, in their military family, right? Uh, which is very different from what, you know, civilians experienced. So I, I think they're, I, I, I would say maybe, I don't think veterans resent civilians, but I think they think that they don't, uh, civilians don't appreciate what the military has done for our, or ha does for our country, right? I think there's, um, we're definitely better at it than, um, than during Vietnam, when not only were, you know, veterans uh, not appreciated, they were actually, um, you know, spit upon when they, when they, they came back, right? They were, they were called a lot of nasty names, um, you know, people, you know, looked down upon that. At least with this most recent conflict, um, you know, veterans, I think uh, their, their roles are being appreciated more. But if you think about it, you know, with the conflict for the last 20 years, we've been in a war right, for the last 20 years. How many people have been able to go along with their daily lives, not affected by that at all? Very different from how it was, let's say, during World War II, right? This is something that everybody was aware of, everybody was contributing to the war effort. How many civilians do you think contributed to the war effort in Afghanistan and, and Iraq? Not very much at all. Like you say, it's only 1% or 2% of service. I mean, 99, 98% of people don't have anything to do with that. Exactly. So there's, there's that disconnect, right? Uh, and so that's why I think the, um, that military culture series that I developed was even more important because I would say, uh, yeah, 80% of the people I work with uh, at, you know, at the doctorate level in the VA have had no experience with the military. They themselves did not serve, um, and they can't even cite uh, a, a close family member who served, right? And so to be treating a patient population that they're essentially defined by the military service and not have a, a full understanding of it, I think um, is, uh, is only to the, the patient's detriment. And so that's why I was you know, very interested in, um, in developing that for 
um, for my colleagues. And so I've, been, had, I've had an opportunity to do that, not only for my VA colleagues, uh, but also the internal medicine program at the VA. I've actually given the, the lecture at, uh, at county uh, conferences um, because the, the county sees a lot of veterans as well. And I actually gave a, a grand rounds at uh, SUNY Upstate uh, a couple of months ago talking about military culture. So this is not something that uh, I've actually seen too much around because again, a lot of folks uh, at, the, at the MD level or the PhD level uh, didn't necessarily serve in the military. Not, not to say they have not, but uh, it tends to certainly be a minority.